Let's consider the problem A77E, Daniel and part-time job. In this problem, you're given a graph. In the sample input, the graph is four nodes, as you can see. Some of these nodes are lit up and some of them are dark. In the sample, one and four are originally start out as lit up. You then have two types of queries. Type one is represented by POW and then a number, which basically says toggle all the lights in the subtree of the number. So for example, POW1 would toggle all four of the lights, whereas POW2 would only toggle light two. The second type of query is get and then a number x. In this type of query, you're supposed to count the rooms in the subtree of x that are currently lit up. For example, in get one, you would count one, two, three, four, and only two of them are lit up, so the answer is two. Whereas in get four, the answer is gonna be one. Okay, let's consider the sample input. For the first query, get one, we have to figure out how many nodes in the subtree of one are currently lit. That is this whole entire tree here. We can count that nodes one and four are lit and none of the rest are. So the answer is two, because there are two nodes that are lit. For the query of get two, we're counting the lit nodes in this subtree here. There are zero. For get three, we're counting the lit nodes here, which is again zero. For get four, we're counting the lit nodes in this subtree, which is one. The next query is a POW1, which means that we have to toggle everything in the subtree of node 1, which is you have to toggle all the nodes. So node 1 is currently lit, so we're going to make it not lit. Node 2 is not lit, so we're going to make it lit. Node 3 is not lit, so we're going to make it lit. Node 4 is lit, so we're going to make it not lit. We don't have to print out anything for the power queries. Now, when we query POW1, or sorry, get 1, we count how many nodes are lit in this whole tree, and there are two, but the nodes are changed. They're now two and three. We then query get two, there is one lit node. When we query get three, also one lit node. And when we query get four, there are zero lit nodes. The prerequisite for this problem is segment trees with lazy propagation. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do to solve this problem is we're gonna create a DFS order. So we start at our root one, and we just basically DFS, adding each node to the DFS order as we traverse it. So since we start at one, we immediately add that to our DFS order. We then search the first child, we get to node two. Node two doesn't have any child, so we return to node one and search the second child, node three. Node three again doesn't have any children, so we go back to node one and we search the third child, and we add node four to our ordering. Since the sample input graph is very simple, let's consider this graph here. We start out at our root, which is node 1, and we add that to our order. We then DFS to the first node, which is node 5, and we add that to our order. We then DFS to 5's first node, 7. 7 has no children, so we go back to 5, and we go down to 3. We then go down to 4. 4 has no children, so we go back up to 3. 3 has no other children, so we go to 5. 5 has no other children, so we go back to 1, which goes to 6 and then node 6 goes to node 2. We're going to create the DFS ordering again, but this time, as we do it, we're going to keep track of the start index and the end index of each node, and I'll explain what that means as I go along. So we start at node 1, which is our root. So we add it to the DFS ordering, and the index is 1, so the start index is then 1 for node 1. We then traverse to node 5, and we add node 5 to the ordering. The index for node 5 starts at 2. We then go to node 7. Node 7 we put as the third item. So we put index of 3 for node 7 to start. However, node 7 has no children, so we Im immediately reverse and go back to node 5. Since we are leaving node 7, if you think of the recursion, the recursive function is ending for node 7. The end index for node 7 is also 3. Then from node 5, we go to node 3 here. We add 3 to the ordering, it's at index 4. From node 3, we go to node 4. We add 4 to the ordering, it is currently at index 5. Now from node 4, the recursive function is done because there are no children, which means that we also put the end index as 5, because that is the current index that we have filled up to. 
If we were currently fold up to node 7, we would put it there, but we're not. So we put our current index at node 5. We then go back to node 3. The recursive function for 3, however, is also over because we already did node 4. So then we look at how many nodes of the DFS ordering we filled up. We filled up 5, so the end index for node 3 is also 5. A good way to keep track of this is to use a vector for DFS ordering and just count the size. And that will be your index, or size minus 1 is your index. We're then done with node 3, so we go back to node 5. Now node 5 has no other children, so we then look at the index that we are on, and we are currently pointed towards index 5. That's how many DFS ordering we've filled up. So for node 5, the end index is also 5. We then go back to node 1. Node 1 traverses to trial 6. We add 6 to our DFS ordering. The current index is 6. So the start index is then the current index, which is 6. We then traverse down to the trial 2. We add that to the DFS order. We check the current index, which is 7. So we put that as our start index. Node 2 has no more children. So we traverse we end the recursive function for node 2. We check our current index in DFS ordering. That's 7. So that's our end index. We then go back to node 6. Node 6 is also done. We check our current index, which is 7. So we mark that there. Uh, we then go back to node 1. Node 1 is also done. So we check our current index. That's 7. And that's the end index for node 1. Now what does this table represent? Let's look at node 5. The start index is 2 and end index is 5. That represents this range right here. This means everything from 2 to 5 is in the subtree of node 5. And this is accurate because if we look at the subtree of node 5, it's nodes 5, 7, 3, 4. And these are the same we see in the DFS ordering, 5, 7, 3, and 4. Let's consider another example just to be sure that this is correct. If we look at node 6, the range is from 6 to 7. This means we should have the uh, nodes 6 and 2. If we look at the subtree of node 6, it is 6 and 2. Let's say that nodes 5, 4, and 2 are turned on, and the rest of them are turned off. Well, we can use a 1 to represent nodes that are turned on, and a 0 to use ne re to represent nodes that are turned off. We can build a seg tree on these values. So now, if we want to find the number of nodes that are turned on in subtree 5, we look at the range 2 to 5, and we can find the sum of this range. We can find a sum of a range of an array and log in using a segment tree, which is why we built a seg tree on these zeros and ones. Note that we may put a 1 for node 5 here, not for node 2. This is because we put a 1 based on the DFS order, not the index. When we sum up this range, we get 2 which is correct. The number of on ones in node 5 is 2. The only thing left to do is to toggle a subtree. Let's consider an example. Let's say first thing we do is we toggle 4. This is from index 5 to 5, which is right here. So we're going to change it from a 1 to a 0. And now it's no longer lit. Now let's say we want to query 5. From 2 to 5, the sum is 1, so we print out 1. Let's say now we want to toggle 5. So from 2 to 5, we simply change all these values to the opposite of what they were. Of course, the segment tree will do this with lazy propagation, but this is just a visualization. Now let's say we query 1. Index 1 to 7, that's the whole thing. The sum is 4, and there are exactly 4 on update a range, we're going to use lazy propagation. Let's call lazy our lazy propagation array and tree our segment tree array. To update a range, we just simply say lazy x++ and we'll deal with that in our push function. Lazy x++ just says we're updating this range one time because we're adding one to it. In the push function, the first thing we do is we say lazy x mod equals to 2. This, this is because if we update the same range twice, it's actually like updating it zero times because it toggles once and toggles whack. We only care about the mod 2. 
We then say 3x equals absolute value of lazy x times r minus l plus 1 minus 3x. r and l is our left and right indexes in the tree. The reason we say r minus l plus 1 is because that's how many values are in the range. For example, if the range is from 5 to 5, it'll be 1. We multiply this by lazy x because this is, let's, let's assuming everything was originally off, this is how many ons we would want. Now the thing is, everything's not originally off. Tree x is how many on nodes there currently are. So you subtract tree x from lazy x times r minus l plus 1. The possible problem here is if lazy x is 0. You could use an if statement, or you could simply say absolute value. If you use the absolute value, then what will happen is, this term will come out to 0 because lazy x equals 0, and negative tree x, just to so take the absolute value, and you get positive tree x. So it stays the same. The runtime and memory for this seg tree is the same as a normal seg tree. The runtime of O of Q log n, because you have Q queries and each query runs in log n, whether this query be to access the range and sum it up, or the query be to update it and toggle all the bets. The memory is O of n, the same as a normal seg tree. You declare an array of size 4n. This concludes the solution to this problem.